uh, functioning, shall I say, kind of put it like this, uh, functioning properly, you know, flowing with the Spirit of God and flowing by life. And so leadership isn't just some sort of a bestowal of a title and, you know, now you've got all the power you need to do whatever. And um, as a matter of fact, um, with true leadership in Christ, you really don't have a whole lot of power. You just need to have a heart for the Lord. And that's why Jesus said, you know, he that will be greatest among you will be servant of all. That's not some sort of a, you know, well, you're going to be a maid now or something like that. But the concept behind that is a, a, real, a real spirit of, uh, what does the scripture say in Corinthians about um, we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants <clears throat> for Christ's sake because when you serve people uh, sometimes this, this may sound weird but sometimes people still don't appreciate you you do nice things or you're trying to help somebody, they don't always appreciate you. And um, we may still have some sort of an earthly concept that every time you do something good, everybody should go, yay, yay, yeah. <laughs> People don't always do that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, a whole lot of it goes unnoticed except by the Father. The Father notices everything. <clears throat> and so Jesus says things like, when you pray, go into your closet and pray. When you give an alms, Given alms or something, do it in private and whatever. He says, don't do it to be seen with men, but do it and your Father who seeth in secret will know. And when the bottom line is, is that you're really after pleasing the Lord, I mean, that really, really, you know, we're all supposed to say that. We're all Christians, we're supposed to say that. Our motivation is to please the Lord. But, you know, when we're real, I mean, I want to be real. And I want to be real with myself. You know, if I if I'm if I can't be real with myself, then I'm in real trouble because I'm deceiving my own self. Who needs the devil to deceive me? I, I'm doing a good job all by myself, convincing myself of things. But but I want to uh, be about the Father's business. I want my heart set on His glory, and sometimes. Bringing the heart of the Lord glory isn't by accomplishing a great ministry or a great thing. Sometimes it's being rejected and doing it in the right spirit. I mean, that brings Him glory, man. You know, we say, no, no, no. The way this is supposed to work, <laughs> the way it's supposed to work is that we all pull together and do this thing, and that's what's glorious. Well, that's wonderful. And if we can do that, then we should do that. And I would encourage us to do that regularly. It will make my job much easier. But the truth is, is that many times it doesn't work that way. Everybody isn't always going to be applauding you and thinking that you're doing, you know, oh, this is so good and everything. You know, there's a scripture that says, Jesus says to his followers, they shall kill you thinking they're doing God's service. Well, that's a little scary. Because this, this, it must be, this, this isn't just rank sinners we're talking about. This is people who think they're serving God. And they think that the highest service they can bring to God is to kill you. And if you, in all sincerity and with all your heart, are trying to serve Jesus, then whether their motivation is to kill you or to remove you or to do something to you, doesn't change your motivation. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you, you begin and you say, I'm beginning to be a leader and a minister, and, and, and my motivation is to serve and please the Lord. And then somebody does something against you, that shouldn't change your motivation. Your motivation should be to glorify Jesus still. And, and, and if you can't glorify Him by breaking forth in some great ministry, you glorify Him by hanging on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Amen? Amen. You, you glorify Him by acknowledging 
the different realities of his sacrifice. When he said that, he says, forgive them, they know not. That was part of the, the, the sins of ignorance that, that they had. And the sacrifices of Christ didn't just cover all the sins that we knew we were doing. There were sacrifices for sins of ignorance. And so as he hangs on that cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know. He said, well, they ought to know. See, that's our response. You know, well, they ought to know. And I don't know why they don't know. Well, you know, I scratch my head and say, I don't know why either. But if they don't, if they don't, see the greater truth, then it is our place. Not to be a great leader, but to lead by demonstrating the nature of Christ. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, as we go through this course, you're going to see leadership in a whole different light than, you know, uh, gee, I'm tired of being a PM and I'd like to be a great leader. Personally, I'd rather be a PM. You know, I'd rather be a uh, out of the way, unseen, and, you know, nothing. And let somebody else do it. But you know, the problem is, is that a lot of people will not take shots for Jesus. They won't, you know, this your incoming, this your boom, you know, and, and keep walking for Jesus, keep going saying, hey, you know, and of course that may not be a bullet or a rocket, that may be just a fiery dart from the devil. You know what I mean? Scriptures talk about that. Fiery dart from the enemy. Could be a word that is spoken that brings hurt. You know? It could be just a look that somebody gives you. It could be any number of things. But those things should not quench the eternal fire of life within us. Amen? Mm -hmm. like, but but they, they hurt our little feelings. And they do. I mean, I'm not, I'm not immune to that. I get my feelings hurt all the time. The problem, the deal is I try not to go by my feelings. You see, that, that may be the key. Some people have said to me, well, gosh, Randy, I just, you know, I don't see you with your feelings hurt over stuff that people do and all this kind of stuff. You just must be some sort of really super saint. And of course, that's laughable. No, I'm going to get my feelings hurt all the time. But I made a commitment years ago not to go by my feelings, but to go by the Word of God. You know? And so, you know, it don't, don't misread. Just because I'm not reacting and going, oh, and running out of the room crying, or, you know, whatever. I guess I wouldn't do a whole lot of that. But, you know, whatever reaction, you're, oh, I'm going to kill you, or something like that. You know? <laughs> that's not, you know, that's not because of a super spirituality. So, so spiritual that I don't have feelings and, or even the, the major potential for reaction. It's because, doggone it, I don't want to go by my feelings. I want to go by the Word of God and I want to go by the nature of Christ. And I really do want to do that. And even today, I was driving and, uh, um, or in the car and thinking about something and, and uh, a thought came to my mind and I didn't, I couldn't defeat that thought at that moment. And so I just turned to my Jesus and I said, Lord, I love you so much and I know what my reaction should be over just this thought coming to my mind. And, and I'm not just gushing with your nature and your spirit, but I want you to know that that's what I do want. And I want you to know that I'm not pleased when it's not there. And I want you to know that as much as in me is, I am on your side. And in fact, right now, I'm just going to look into your face. And as I do, I just know that the spirit of this thing is going to have to grasp me. Even if, but for a moment, it'll be better than sitting there with some, you know, thought and letting it fester, you know, boiling or something like that. And it was gone. You know, I believe there's a deeper work that God wants to do in me yet so that, you know, some of those things won't even come up. That work had not been done. And in the meantime, in the name of Jesus, I am not going to side with the enemy, and I am not going to side with my flesh, and I am not going to sit and whine or mope or muddle things in my I am not going to do it. I love Jesus, and I really love him, and I love him more than I love me. So, you know, you have to sometimes, you know, the, the hardest person I talk to is me. <laughs> Now, that's an area. You know, you've never seen me jumping on my wife like that, Lord, but I mean, you know, 
Actually, she is a minister. She gets it more than you were, but yeah. So this whole thing of leadership really, really is not a, a concept of leadership at all. It's a concept of, of getting lower, not higher. And, and it's not a concept of getting lower so you can get higher. A secret, sneaky way it's called. Oh, oh, God's using reverse psychology. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. It's not. God's not trying to sneak up on you, and and, and you shouldn't be trying to sneak up on God. You know, the whole deal is, is that there is a, a an understanding of His nature, and there is a desire for Him, and and the more you get closer to Jesus. The more you sense his heartbeat, the more that you, you want to be about his business. You want to manifest and you want to, I mean, for example, when I was young, and I probably told this story before, but when I was younger in the Lord, I really, really wanted an older grandfather figure type person to be able to literally come up and sit at his feet and he goes, well, well, son. You know, and open the Bible to me and just speak words that you're just going, oh, I mean, golly, you're just so wonderful. You know, Jesus, and you've been walking in this for a long time, and, and I'm just so glad to be sitting here, and, you know, that sort of thing, you know. And just, you know, and, if, and anytime you have a question or something, just kind of sit down and just kind of lay on your legs there with that old tattered Bible in my country. Wisdom that just blows away every thought and problem that you have. You know, I really wanted that. You know, and so I found myself kind of leaning toward people that were like that. The problem is I couldn't find anybody that was really like what I had in my mind. You know, I mean, you know, I just didn't find a whole lot of old people that are real solid and just blurting the word out and you, you got around them, you just kind of had to walk in through the veil of the Lord <laughs> you know and, and finally one day I was just crying out to the Lord and he said well right now it doesn't look like you're going to find that or have that so why don't you intend on growing up for the rest of your life on this planet until one day you got gray hair and somebody can sit down and you can bless them well I got the gray hair I just don't have the wisdom yet and whatever but you see what I'm saying I mean, you know, the, we're, we're, we're wanting things, and the truth is, to be a true leader is, you may have to give up everything so that somebody else has it. Isn't that weird? But I mean, I really, I mean, I've, I've, I've embraced that on several different levels in my own life. I've settled some things, when I say I've settled it, it doesn't mean I don't still have desire or whatever, but I've settled some things that... You know, it is not my place to gather in those things. But Lord, help me to be that to somebody else someday. And I can be a blessing on some level. You know, you understand what I'm talking about. On some level, to be a blessing to somebody else in that way. And, you know, Lord willing, He will do that. But the development of leadership, I believe, involves a couple of different things. And one is, of course, there's no substitute. Just being with the Lord in a very real way. I mean, really, really. And, and that's something you can't really fake. I mean, well, I guess you can. But uh, I remember when I was in Bible school, uh, I remember we would sit in a big circle and we had a bunch of people, a big circle, we had a bunch of people, people to share, and, you know, and, and there were people who would have something and they would share. And really what they had to share, it didn't sound like they'd been in the Word or spent any time with God. They were just kind of quoting the Scripture. But they were saying it real excitedly. And they were trying to get us all excited. You know. And, you know, I don't want to just be excited because of emotion. I want to be excited because of, of the living Christ that is impact in my life or, or even be excited for someone else that he's impacting them. And then sure enough, boy, somebody would speak and man, we took note of them that they had been with Jesus. You know, and when they talk, you just kind of go, you know, I remember jealousy arising in me many different times going, oh, buddy, I'm sure with the Lord like that. I want Jesus like that. 
I want to know the Lord like that. I want to be close to the Lord like that. I, oh, you know, and instead of, you know, me going, you know, being jealous and going, what? You just think you're holier than thou because you saw something. You know, I would let that affect me to say, God, I want to know you. And, and I loved, and I still do to this day, it doesn't matter, and this is the honest truth, if somebody stood up in this gathering and shared something as simple as Jesus saves, and it was life to them, and it meant so much to them, I would just, there's just this bubbly, tickly thing that happens, and I just, you know, say, oh, you know that, Randy. I know that. I love to hear the truth. I love hearing people laying hold of Jesus on whatever level. They don't have to, you know, I don't go, well, gee, I passed that a long time ago. What are you, an idiot? You know? The truth is, if that was my attitude, then I haven't passed that at all. I have left that. <laughs> I've left the living relationship with Christ. And so, I believe that there is no substitute for just uh, spending time with the Lord, getting close to the Lord, not just spending time, because I, I, I always hate to say stuff that will, you know, we'll read that in some religious kind of way. What I really mean more than like spending time and making time, going, okay, then for the next hour, I'm going to, or whatever, is like the woman that pressed through the crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She said, this guy, is so, so wonderful, so powerful, so glorious, that even though all these people are around him, and there's these guys called disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they're, they're hand-picked by this guy, and then there's all this crowd, including big-name people, and, you know, all of this. And, and so, I, if I could just, I mean, he is so big and wonderful, if I could just touch just the little hem of his garment, my whole life will be changed forever. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody that's pressing through to this Jesus that is all glorious. And then she turns and oh, and Jesus stops the whole thing. She's going, oh, I didn't do this for this. You know, it's just this whole rigmarole happens. And yet in her heart, all she wanted to do, it wasn't some little humility attitude that if I could just barely tell, it was no, no. He is so big, and there's so much going on around his life. If I could just wiggle through here and get out just close enough to him. Yes! You know? And in a certain sense, you don't see a lot of that. You don't see a hunger and a deep down drive that says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You see it for a little while in your faith, and you get back in your faith. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And when it begins to to even start the faith, you say, no, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you just want, you just, you just want your life consumed by the Lord. And, and you can do that, you, you do that by making decisions on the inside. I mean, I was thinking about identification with Christ. Of course, that happens on several different levels. But I was thinking, you know, of, of different people who's identified with Christ, certainly outwardly, and, and everybody knows that. Um, you know, Joseph was, was sitting there yesterday and he had this hat on with this big cross on it. And you know, I mean, you're standing there talking to me. Eyes are continually going up and looking at that cross. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, if you're a sinner, if anybody anywhere, you know, say, fella, are you a Christian? You know, and that's pretty much, you know, that, you know, and then, of course, she see his car. And, and, would you be maybe one of them Christian <laughs> Well, you know, those are outward things, but there has to be this inward thing that takes over that brings the outward, where there's such an identi identification with Christ that you have made up your mind that from now on, forever, when people know you, they're going to know the Lord. When people know you, they're going to actually come in to, I don't know how to put this, come into the presence or come into contact with the Lord in some way that, that you are not just you anymore. Does that make sense? You are not just you anymore. You are truly an ambassador, a representative, a picture, an actual reality, living, a vessel filled with His life that is bringing light into a dark world. 
and doing that on all sorts of different levels. Well, imagine, imagine a group of Christians and one person makes that commitment in their heart. They do it strictly because of Jesus. Well, you know what? They're going to end up leaving people. They, in their mind, they may not even be saying, I'm going to be a leader. They're just saying, man, I just want to be identified with Christ. I don't want my identity apart from Christ. Then they're going to end up leading people, and you can't get around them. That's what you're going to do. Eventually, because why? Because you are one with Him. You, you are bringing Him. You are, you're not, somebody isn't having to talk you into, now come on, now you ought to do this, and you should pray more. You know what I mean? I mean, that's in you. You're just about his business, and you can't help but being about his business. And before too long, that breaks out. It breaks out. And it breaks out in forms of what we call leadership. But still in the heart of that person, he may not or she may not be thinking about leading as much as, I want to get to Jesus, and well, if I can help us get to Jesus, do you understand what I just said? It's I, They've already made up their mind, and now they're seeing it on a larger scale, and they're thinking, well, maybe I can help more of us get to Jesus. You see what I mean? Or, or dispense Jesus, express Jesus, or how, whatever ministry or thing that comes up. There's just this enfolding in Him, and then your horizons broaden to include others. And in the process, whether you want to or not, you're you're leading. And you're doing it because see that's the good thing that I like about the difference between being a shepherd and a horse rancher, cattle rancher. Is a shepherd walks before the sheep and they hear his voice and they follow him. But he's going he's he's the one heading into it. You know what I mean? If it's the valley of the shadow of death, guess who's in there first? The shepherd. But a cattle rancher, he gets on his horse and he drives those cattle. He gets behind them. And he goes, ah! Yeah! Yeah! Get on there! Yeah! Some of you have seen ministries like that. <laughs> and it, you know, you may get to your destination, but have you glorified God? Is, you know, well, yeah, we got to where God wanted us. Well, the means, we say that the end justifies the means. I believe the end and the means are supposed to be the same, the same spirit. So it doesn't justify in my mind. If you're driving them there and say, well, we got to the location God wanted us, you still miss God as far as I'm concerned. Well, forget my concern. I believe as far as God's concerned. But if you lead them there in the right spirit and the right nature and everything, You've done something greater than arrive at a location that God wanted everybody at. You have released the spirit and nature of Christ in the earth. You have released the sweet fragrance of Christ. You have, you have done something eternal. Because whatever ministry you do may not be eternal. Sure, it could have eternal effect. But that spirit in which you do it in is the eternal spirit. Who by the eternal spirit See, we just do stuff. We think that's all that matters. No, by the eternal spirit, God <coughs> wants us to function and to bring about these things. So, anyway, I was thinking about uh, a good example of this was uh, the man Joshua. Turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 17. And my, my intro only took up half the time. Exodus 17. Let's see if I get this right here. I do this sometimes. Well, that's got his name, but that is not the one that I was looking for. Try, uh, chapter. Oh, I'm sorry. That's my problem. I'm in the wrong book. It rarely happens. 17 verse uh, 14. This is, this is uh, when they're getting down the road a little bit. Here's, here's the example. 
is that you have Moses, so you have, you have God, and you have Moses, and you have Joshua. All right, and there's there's this obvious obvious thing going on with Moses and God. Okay, there's no question in anybody's mind that something's happening, and it's of God when it comes to Moses, the man. Now you also got to remember because we we just romanticize that and we say, well, everybody just said no, I didn't either. Man, there was whole bunches, I mean bunches of people that came against Moses continually. Okay? So don't romanticize that. I mean, he, he was of God, but it, it wasn't so obvious. Now, it should have been hugely obvious. But it wasn't so obvious. And so there were constantly battles, including with his own brother and sister. Aaron, who became the high priest. Miriam, you know. So there were all this stuff going on. But Joshua, who was a young man, and Moses was already in his 80s, Joshua noticed something was going on here between God and Moses. And he saw events and communications and miracles and just different. He was just viewing all sorts of things of this relationship, and it drew Joshua out of the crowd. And it moved him toward Moses because what Joshua didn't have as a young man, Moses did. Now, don't you know that somebody who's really been with the Lord, been in the presence of the Lord, can get around you just a little while and it's like they rub the glory that they had off on you. Has anybody ever experienced that? I mean, you just with someone you're just going, man, yeah, yeah, I just want to hang with you for a while. I mean, because this is, yeah, this is my stuff. You know, this is what I want, you know. And, and I think that Joshua saw that and he said, I wanted some of that. So here's, here's part of the process is, is that in, in this process, Joshua's becoming a leader and whatever, and Moses is up on the mountain and they're holding his arms up and everything, and Joshua's down there fighting the battle and, and this whole thing's going on. But there's something more going on than just a battle and just people in different positions and everything. Moses is bringing this reality of God further down into Joshua. And verse 14 and the... Um, Let's see, verse 13. And Joshua van coursed to Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Why didn't he say, Write this as a memorial and rehearse it in the book of all the people? Why didn't he say, Do it in the ears of all the leadership? He said, Let me tell you, Moses, you got somebody there that's going to listen. And these memorials will mean something to them. To, to just your average Joe Christian, he's going to go, oh, that was really cool. Hey, remember the time that we fought Amalek and, you know, we won? And that's all they have left. You know, that's all they have of the experience. They have an experience and they go, hey, remember the time? It was cool. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Hey, remember the time that... Yeah. Not Joshua. <coughs> Rehearse this thing. Rehearse it. Rehearse it into him. Get the memorials inside of this guy because there's something that he has ears to hear. He wants the Lord in a different way than, than some of the other people do. Look in chapter 24, verse 13. This is where uh, Moses is going up into the mountain. Now, most of us know the story where he went up into the mount and he got the Ten Commandments and he came back down and the children of Israel were sinning and he took the Ten Commandments and he broke them down. He broke them. And, you know, most of us know that story. One of the 
things that a lot of us don't know is that Moses didn't go up there alone. A lot of people don't know. Moses didn't go up there alone. Verse, uh, what did I say, 13? And Moses rose up and his servant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. Now, that's a funny term, but you're going to find that. Uh, anybody ever studied the relationship of Elijah and Elisha? Elisha was the younger of the two, and he was called Elijah's servant. What is said of him, this is the great preparation he had. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. I was reminded of that in Cuba, and Doug had been shaking a lot of hands, and his hands were dirty, and I had some water, and I said, oh, can I, can I pour water on my hands? And he said, sure, my son. And I felt real spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, this is a true spirit, but it's not, it is not, you know, there's no way that we can describe this. To be a, a servant in the manner that this is speaking of and in the manner that Jesus spoke of when he said, he that will be greatest of all will be, be a servant. It is nothing like we can conceive of because we have a wrong concept, and Jesus says, no, this is one of the most wonderful things you could ever do. It is greatness in the kingdom. I mean, I'm telling you, we, we still affix our thoughts and our understandings to this thing, but there is a relationship of, of connection. There is a relationship of flow that, that you don't have simply just being a servant or serving something. You know what I mean? I mean you, you know, you can go get some food and serve somebody and not have that spirit or not, not truly draw the benefits of that. And, but this is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful union that begins to take place. And so, you know, they go up into the mount. And I think I got the next scripture down here, uh, 3217, I think that's the one. Yes. So they're up in the mount, and, and the whole story is, is that uh, Moses is up there, and what has happened in reality is that the mountain's kind of like this, and the people of God are all down here, and Joshua has gone halfway up the mount, and God said to, or Moses said to Joshua, wait here until I come back, and Moses went all the way up into the mount, and there was the presence of God and, you know, filling the whole thing. And so, um, so we have this story at this point, uh, verse 15, and Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other side they were written, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved upon the table. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, and Moses said, it is not the voice of them who shout for master, neither is it the voice of them who cry for being overcome, but the noise of them who sing do I hear. And so Moses is up here, he's in the presence of God. Now, you have to, you have to picture this. He's, he is up there, he is enfolded in the presence of God. He is looking into the face of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is upon him. He's glowing. He's been separated. Not, not a day. You know, well, I, I spent the whole afternoon in the scripture. No, no. He's been up there 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, that's, that would be a good soaking. You know, that would be a good soaking. God would be coming out of your pores. And, and they would look good. So here, I mean, he is just in the presence of God. And, all, and so, and then he's got the tables of stone, and all of a sudden he hears something. He goes, oh boy. And he goes down and meets Joshua. And Joshua is further along than the rest of them, but he has not been in the presence of God like Moses. So he goes, oh, I'm hearing a noise down there. It sounds like maybe they're fighting with the enemy or something like that. Moses says, well, your discernment isn't quite there yet. God's working on you. God's bringing you into leadership. God's, and when I say leadership, again, God is making you a discerner. 
Okay? You understand what I mean? Instead of a leader, he's making you a discerner. It's a big difference, folks. And but it's not quite there. And so what happens? His ear has heard this stuff going on. And his ear has as his mind has talked about Joshua, his mind has conceived what he thought was going on. But now Moses comes down. He's been in the presence of God. And when he speaks, he says, no, that's not what it is. Joshua still doesn't know for sure. Moses knows. So they go down. Sure, they have a big party going on. They made a golden calf, all this. Moses takes the tables of stone, breaks them. And Joshua's watching this whole thing. See, we forget about all this kind of stuff. But Joshua's standing right there gets down to the bottom of the hill, sees the golden calf, sees everybody dancing naked, going, no, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And, and you know, and he's been at least up here close enough where he's closer to God, and he knows this ain't good. <laughs> no, this, this can't be good. And so, and, and so he sees Moses take those stones and throw them down. Somebody way off back over here at the back of the camp sees Moses throw down those stones and breaks them and goes, God, that's just like that Moses guy. Gets upset, gets a little ticked off, throws a fit, throws down the work of God. God worked hard to make those tables of stone. Moses got an attitude. Moses just threw those things down and broke them. That ain't right. Okay. Joshua's standing right there at Moses. He's been, he went up there with him. He's far enough. He knows what. Then he came down. He, he conceived what he thought was going on. Now he saw what was going on. And it was exactly what Moses had said was going on. And he's standing there watching the whole thing. And when he sees those tables go down, he goes, he's signifying that they've already broken the law. If you broke the law in one place, you've broken the whole law. Big one incident, two different pictures, amen? What makes a difference? What makes a difference? The presence of God, getting closer to God, growing up, being attached, maturing in the heart of the Lord, not just the religious things and being the top Pharisee in the land. We don't need any more top Pharisees. We've got plenty of them right now. We need more people in the image of Christ. All right. So um, let's look in chapter 33, next chapter in verse uh, 11. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, notice the word, a young man, and this is way after this chapter 33, this is way after chapter 17, where he defeated the enemy, the Amalekites. Okay. He's still a young man, departed not out of the temple. Well, you know, I didn't have time to look up that scripture, but there is a scripture in the Bible that says, they who sought the Lord did not depart out of the temple. Anybody remember that scripture? There's a scripture in the in the Old Testament, that just is a general statement. They who sought the Lord departed not out of the tabernacle. Sorry, I said tabernacle. They who sought the Lord, and this is scripture, departed not out of the tabernacle. Well, guess who was there all the time? Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Well, boy, don't you have a home? <laughs> Haven't you got your own tent? Yeah, I got a tent. I mean, you're a young man. Get out there and hunt you down a little filly. Yeah, I mean, don't you think that they have thoughts similar to our thoughts? And he's thinking one thing. Man, I want to live. They who saw the Lord. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. You see, nobody's coaching this guy. That's significant. Because a true leader, and now let's flash 
forward now real quick and go into the future. And we see Joshua bringing them across the Jordan River. We see him taking in into the land. We see him taking Jericho. We see him taking every section, cutting it in half. I mean, that's how that was how they took the land was they, they came in and and uh, like I said, Jordan River like this. They came in right here and they divided the land just like that. They divided the enemy first from this side to that side and then this side to that side. And they took the whole land, and Joshua led them, and it was one of the most glorious victories. It was one of the least troublesome times just about that they ever had. They were all of one mind, one accord. We're following Joshua. By the way, you know what Joshua is? That's the Hebrew the Hebrew name for what is the Greek name in, in uh, Greek? Jesus. Joshua. Jesus. It's the same, same name. Same name. Because it re Joshua, in that sense, represents Jesus. And so, but it, as, just as an individual, nobody's coaching him. Nobody's saying, well, you know what? <coughs> Buddy, if you'll spend some extra time in the tabernacle, you get extra credit. Nobody ever said that. No. Nobody's saying, you know, if you pour a little water on Moses' hand, you'll be able to go halfway up the mountain. <laughs> You know, nobody's telling him that. Nobody's prepping him. No, there's just something in him, and he can't stop it. He wants the Lord. He wants He wants to serve Moses. He wants to serve the Lord. He wants to serve the body. It's just in him. And so he is giving himself in ways that he has no clue in the future how powerful it's going to be. And thank God, amen? Thank God. This wasn't just a situation where where Moses looked around and said, let's see, you, you'll be the next leader. Now, this was a situation that God, and it wasn't just God saying, okay, I choose you. It was Joshua saying, I choose God too. I want you, Lord. And I, and when, I, when I'm too tired or when I'm this or that or when I'm whatever, in the name of Jesus, I ain't too anything. I want the Lord. And you pick yourself up and you go. And you, you know, I mean, one of the hardest things for a lot of people is to be uh, self-governed. And what I mean by that is, most people are self-governed, what I mean is, is that you can't put them on a job where they're responsible for their own time and their own work pace and their own, because, you know, you, you do that and they go, well, okay, well, I'll just slow down and, you know, I'll make this job that, uh, since I'm getting paid by the hour, I'll make this job that should last two days last five. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, I'll just, uh, since nobody's, I'm not having to punch a time clock, um, I'll just get there two hours late, nobody will know. I'll leave an hour early and nobody will know. My point is this. Very few of us are motivated, have the government within us that says, get up, go, be faithful, do this on time, da -da -da -da, this and that. We don't have that. Most people don't have that. It, you know, I'll tell you what, for a lot of pastors, it's tough. Because they don't, I mean, for me, you give me a little short little break there, I want to be at the Lord. And I'm going to be in the Word, and I'm going to be seeking the Lord. I mean, I, I you know, it's not because I'm better than anybody else, but it's just, I, can, I don't even have to think about it. It's like, yeah, you know, my hands go to the Bible. I want to know the Lord, and I want to be with the Lord. And when I'm thinking, when I'm praying, when I'm doing all that, it's because his concern, not my concern. When I want, when I give up time and things that I could, well, you know, this is legal. Nobody would be mad at me if I just relaxed a little bit here. It's not about anybody being mad at you or this or that. It's, it's, you know, for me, it's like you got, you know, you only have one life. How many lives do you get? Well, I think just one. You get one life. It just seems like yesterday to me that I was in Bible school. It seems like yesterday to me that I was in my early 20s. I am blown away at how fast time goes. And I'm not exaggerating. I am blown away. It's like when you're born and to the age you finally get married and have kids, everything's just kind of going in slow motion. You know, age seven. Uh, my goodness. 
all of a sudden, man, you get married and start having kids, and then you look at them going, where did everything go? How could it go so quickly? And, you know, I've said this before, but, well, I'm 53 years old. I saw it. In Jeff's house, we got a book. Uh, I, I got a book from Jeff's house, and it was about uh, rare books, and it was all the rare books of T. Austin Sparks and all this stuff, and, it, and I got it from Jeff's house in, in Costa Rica, and it was a house in Decatur, some people in Decatur that had this rare book place where you could get all these, and so I had Deb call, and, you know, we looked on the thing, and the book was last distributed, this one, that he had was 1994, and they changed phone numbers and stuff like that, and maybe weren't even in business anymore. Still waiting to hear back on those phone numbers. Right. But what occurred to me is, what if those people were, you know, like 70, in their early 70s when they started that thing? And 94 may not sound like that long ago, but it's almost been 10 years. That would make them 80 something. They may be dead. And then I thought about me, and I thought, you know, 53? I mean, I don't, you know, 63? I mean, 10 year chunks used to be nothing, huh? Like, <laughs> 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 I haven't got a whole lot of 10 year chunks left. But totally apart from that in the sense of my physical age now, I have always thought I got one life. I really am so thankful that. Jesus called me, saved me, and, and gave me an opportunity that I could live for Him, and I don't want to waste that. And I really, really still feel that way. And it's not about, I mean, there's an element of, you know, oh, one day I'll stand before the throne, and, you know, like the, before the Wizard of Oz or something. Ah! You know, I, I'm not really all, you the thunder, I see more than back me up on that one. I'm not really worried about, about standing before the Lord as much as I'm worried about letting time slip out of my hands. I'm trying to redeem the time for the glory of God. So I believe those, those are the kind of things that were working in Joshua. And I believe he's just, you know, he's plugging in there and, and he's, uh, Moses, it says, Moses departed uh, again into the camp. Joshua, the son of Nun, who went into the tabernacle. Well, who else is in that tabernacle? God. God is. And that's what he's thinking about. And the glory of God, where is it located? Over his tent? No, over the tabernacle. So that's where he's at. Anywhere God is, that's where he wants to be. I mean it. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, let's look at uh, Numbers 27 since we're still here. Book of Numbers, not Exodus. Numbers 27. Verse 18 and 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, the man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And the main thing I want you to see is, there is, it, it was said when, when the spies went into the land, remember Israel left Egypt and made their way through the wilderness and they got to the land and they said, let's send in spies. So they sent in 12 spies. One person representing each tribe. Right? One of those guys was Joshua. Remember? Joshua. And one of them was a guy named Caleb. And Caleb and Joshua went in with the other 10 
And the other ten got in there and said, oh my God, there's giants in here. Oh, this is not, this is not good. This, this could be dangerous for us. We might could lose our lives or, you know, this could cost us going into this promised land thing. I just don't know about that. Joshua and Caleb, are, they all come out and they're giving their story. And Joshua and Caleb are going, look, we can do it. God said we could do it. Those giants are big, but they ain't bigger than God. Come on, man, let's do it. Let's go up immediately. That's what they said. Let's go up at once. We can do it. God's with us. He's promised us the land. The land's already ours, they said. It's already ours. Come on. It says that Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. God says, look, go over here and lay hands on Joshua because he's somebody that's got the spirit of it. He's got the spirit. And I don't just mean talking about that kind of mumbo jumbo. I'm talking about the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about in the power of the spirit bringing forth the word, bringing forth what God wants being able by the spirit of life within you to stand against the stuff going off in you. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, we can't, if we can't defeat the enemies going off in us, you know, you think he's going to use us out there? We have a responsibility first, and that's what this whole thing is about with leadership is God ain't working on the world. He ain't, he ain't prepping you for the world. He's prepping you for him. <laughs> you know, he's prepping you for him. You are mine. He says that over and over and over. You are mine. And a lot of times we're not his. I mean, all this stuff comes and we give in to it or, you know, we falter under it and everything. And I, I understand that we all fail and stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about basically being able to live by the spirit of life and to, to basically be governed by life. If we can't do that, no hands ought to ever, 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 ever be laid on us. Amen? Yeah. Did I get just one too many ever? I mean, I just think it's just the truth. We, that, nobody needs to be, you know, so, oh, and you, you are, you know. I mean, just now think about this. Many of the true, real men of God, such as Moses, when it came time to quote unquote lay hands on them or to send them forth in ministry, what was their reaction? I'm not ready. It's not time. I'm, I'm too immature yet. I can't do this. I'm not, you know. See, they weren't going, yep. I'm your man. I am the right one. I knew you would be coming to me soon. I'm the right man for the job. None of them. None of them did that. They all were going to go, whoa. Until the Lord says, no, this is what's supposed to happen. Then you go, this why? You still have all the doubts of yourself. You still feel like, man, I need more maturity. You still feel all of those things. But you have heard his voice, and you're not going by circumstances. You're not going by whether you think this or that. You're not going by all this. You go by one thing, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He says it, then you go, Boy, you look at it. You know, once they said okay, and they did it. They got up and did it. You know, got up and carried on the work of the Lord that God had put into their hand. So, uh, I do have one other scripture, and then we'll quit with that. It may be the same thing here. Deuteronomy 34, which is the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Yes, I'm glad we're closing with this one. Deuteronomy, the last chapter. Verse 9, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom from far Moses had laid his hand upon him. What kind of sentence is that, folks? <laughs> huh? Listen to it. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom far Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. This is impartation. 
This is a flow down from God through Moses to Joshua. He was full of wisdom because God had prepared him. He had prepared his own heart. He, he was going the extra mile. And I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure he wasn't planning. He was going the extra mile. But he was being brought up in the presence of Moses, hearing wisdom, seeing the right reaction, seeing all this over and over and over again until the day came and were laid upon him. Moses said, I'm going away. This is it. And, and uh, right after this, Moses dies. The man who led him all those years, the old, ancient gentleman, is gone. And they're on the verge of going in. Turn to a young man named Joshua and it says, and they hearken unto him. Because they saw the Lord that seen his life every day. They saw when everybody else went to the, the game and he was at the tabernacle of God. You know, they saw consistency in his life. They saw a hunger for God that, that embarrassed some of them. And, it, and so when the time came, even those who made fun of him for not going with them looks and goes, thank God there's somebody in touch with God that can take us in. We went all this far and it'd be a shame to get this far and not get in. Amen? Alright, let's take a break and we'll be